In Yu-Gi-Oh, a trap card is a card with the innate ability of being able to be activated during either player's turn, which is particularly strong advantage as it allows for them to be used as forms of interruption against your opponent during their turn. In order to offset this power, trap cards usually also have the innate disadvantage, where they need to be set on the field first for at least one full turn before they can be activated. But there are some trap cards which have effects that bypass this restriction, and can be activated directly from the hand during either player's turn, provided some kind of condition is met. And in this video we're going to look over the best trap cards in the game which can be activated from the hand, why they're so powerful, and why being able to use them from the hand is so strong. And at number 10 we have Delta Crow Anti-Reverse which, despite its unusual name, is actually designed to support Black Wings. Anti-Reverse is a normal trap card and has the effect that if you control any Black Wing monster, you get to destroy all face-down spell and trap cards your opponent controls, essentially acting as a slightly weaker Harpy's Feather Duster. But Anti-Reverse also has the bonus effect that if you control exactly three Black Wing monsters, no more, no less, you can activate it directly from your hand. Now, having the ability to clear away your opponent's back row is an extremely strong effect, and is why cards like the previously mentioned Harpy's Feather Duster, Heavy Storm, and even the comparatively much weaker Mystical Space Typhoon have all seen some time in the Forbidden and Limited list, as these were all accessible and easy to use ways to deal with your opponent's spell and trap cards. Technically speaking, Anti-Reverse is slightly more difficult to use in that it requires you to control a Blackwing monster to activate it like a regular trap, and three Blackwing monsters in order to use it from your hand like the aforementioned spell cards. For a lot of archetypes, getting three monsters in the field isn't the easiest task in the world. But for Black Wings, this is actually a fairly simple thing to do. You see, many of the Black Wing monsters either have the effect to special summon themselves out from the hand as long as you control another Black Wing monster, like Gale the Whirlwind, or have some kind of effect that helps them swarm the field with other Black Wing monsters, like Oster the South Wind, making Anti-Reverse's activation condition from the hand appear a lot less Herculean. And despite its more difficult activation requirements, there are actually some situations in which Anti-Reverse is actually a more valuable card than either Heavy Storm or Feather Duster, since you can use it during either player's turn due to it being a trap card. You can use Anti-Reverse during your opponent's end phase, after they set up their back row, but before they have the opportunity to activate it during your turn. And if you've happened to set up three Blackwing monsters on field, you can use Anti-Reverse from your hand, meaning that you can bait out your opponent into thinking you don't have any interruption worthwhile, while also preventing Anti-Reverse from being sniped by cards like Cosmic Cyclone or Twin Twisters before you have a chance to activate it, making it a pretty effective tool to stop your opponent from setting up their Floodgates or other problematic trap cards. Although Anti-Reverse does have one key issue when it comes to dealing with opponent's back row, it can only destroy face down spell and trap cards. So if your opponent sees you activate Anti-Reverse while they control a face down, there can be only one, a continuous trap card, they could simply activate there can be only one in response to Anti-Reverse to prevent it from being destroyed. This means that Anti-Reverse can't really be used to clear powerful floodgates or other continuous traps in the same way that Harpy's Feather Duster can. It can only really force their activation or prevent them from being set up during their opponent's turn. Still, Anti-Reverse is an extremely strong card to clear your opponent's back row and even saw competitive playing Blackwing decks up to 2016, as a pretty effective means to deal with your opponent's back row, while cards like Heavy Storm or Feather Duster were either limited or banned, which is why it's deserving of the number 10 spot. Though nowadays, there are simply far better generic options for back row removal that are just easier to use, like Lightning Storm, or even the recently limited Harpy's Feather Duster, even in Blackwing specifically. And at number 9, we have Phantasm Spiral Battle, a normal trap card belonging to the Phantasm Spiral archetype, a deck focused on normal monsters, equip spells, and trap cards that can be activated from the hand. It just so happens Spiral Battle is the best of the three it has. It can only be activated while all monsters you control are normal monsters, which includes tokens, and has a simple effect that you can target one card your opponent controls to destroy it with no once per turn in sight. And if you just so happen to control a face-up Umi, you can activate Spiral Battle from your hand. It also has the bonus effect that you can banish it from the graveyard, including the turn it was sent there, to target a newer monster you control and equip it with the Phantasm Spiral Equip spell cards that you control. At first glance, Spiral Battle doesn't appear to be very usable, especially not from the hand, as not only does it require that you draw it, it also requires you control only normal monsters, meaning that if you control any other additional end board pieces that aren't normal monsters, you can't activate Spiral Battle at all. And the cherry on top of that is in order to use its effect from the hand, you would also need to control Umi. However, Umi is the card which ties the Phantom Spiral strategy together. Not that Umi, and not that Umi, but this Umi, Pacifist, the Phantasm City. Phantasm City is always treated as Umi and has the effect that upon resolution of an opponent's card or effect, except during the damage step, you can special summon a Phantasm Spiral token, provided you control no other tokens. And this special summon counts as the special summon of a normal monster for Phantasm City, meaning its second effect triggers, allowing you to add a Phantasm Spiral card from your deck to your hand, 
including Phantasm Spiral Battle. All at the cost of not being able to normal or special summon effect monsters the turn you use either of the Phantasm City's effects. Yet, despite this somewhat harsh restriction, Phantasm City is able to set up every single requirement to Spiral Battle, an Umi on field, a normal monster, and even search a Spiral Battle from the deck. And because Spiral Battle has no once per turn, if you have multiple Spiral Battles in your hand, you can continuously keep interrupting your opponent by popping any card they control, making it a premium form of interruption that's usable against both back row and combo decks. Now, there are some downsides to Spiral Battle. If you use Phantasm City to search it, you are locked into only being able to summon normal monsters for the turn, but given that Phantasm Spiral decks are more than capable of navigating through the game with only normal monsters, this restriction doesn't really hurt the strategy too much. But if you don't find Phantasm City, Spiral Battle does become a lot harder to use. Still, Spiral Battle more than earns a number 9 spot on this list due to being the main form of interruption this competent control strategy has, and is still seen playing Phantasm Spiral decks to this day for its pretty powerful effect, even though it does need some setup. And speaking of some cards that need setup, and shining through to number 8 is Tachyon Transmigration, the first counter trap card on this list. And being a counter trap card prevents cards and effects from being activated in response to Tachyon Transmigration, unless those cards are also counter trap cards. It can only be activated as a chain link 2 or higher, and you need to control a Galaxy Eyes monster in order to use it, but if you do, you can negate every single spell and trap card and monster effect that your opponent used in the chain prior to Transmigration's activation. And then, instead of destroying those cards or sending them to the graveyard, Transmigration actually shuffles those cards into the deck instead. This would already be an extremely powerful effect on its own, but it also has the ability to be activated from the hand, provided you control any Galaxy Eyes Tachyon Dragon monster. In essence, Tachyon Transmigration can be seen as a better Solemn Strike, as while it's certainly far less generic when compared to Strike, it can negate spell and trap cards and also be used to negate multiple activated effects within the same chain, and thus can be used to negate effects that would otherwise be chain block or protected from a card like Strike. And shuffling the negated cards in the field into the decks makes Transmigration even more absurd, as not only does it clear your opponent's field with their monsters in back row, it also prevents any effects that would activate upon a card leaving the field such as Mirror Jades and Phase Rageki, from having the chance to activate in the first place. But despite being such an amazing form of negation, Tachyon Transmigration doesn't really see too much play in Galaxy Eyes decks. Now at first it may appear that the reason is due to its activation requirement, but getting a Galaxy Eyes monster on the field isn't too difficult for Galaxy Eyes decks, and even number 107 Galaxy Eyes Tachyon Dragon, the original, isn't too difficult to make, as Galaxy Eyes decks heavily focus on making rank 8 monsters. One of the key issues with the card, though, is that it's not really searchable by any reasonable means, so you have to hard draw it in order to use it as a form of interruption or to help break a board, and Galaxy Eyes has plenty of other rank 8 monsters that can be used as interruption and are much more easily accessible since they're in the extra deck, like number 90 Galaxy Eyes Photon Lord and number 39 Hope Harboringer Dragon Titanic Galaxy. And when going second, the deck has a larger number of cards to help break boards in OTK, like Galaxy Eye Cypher Dragon. But there's absolutely no denying that if you happen to activate Transmigration, it can be an absolutely blowout against an opponent's chain link. And since it's activatable from your hand, you can surprise your opponent with a card even when going second, especially since it's so difficult to respond to, putting it firmly at the number 8 spot. Though if it had a consistent way of searching it, it would definitely be higher on this list. A problem which used to be shared with the number 7 card on this list. And at number 7, we have Marine Cess Wave, a normal trap card which gains effects depending on the link rating of the Marine Cess monster you control. If you control any Marine Cess Link monster, including a Link 1, you can use it to target one face up monster your opponent controls and negate its effects until the end of the turn. And if you happen to control a Link 2 Marine Cess monster, Wave also ensures that all monsters you control, including non Marine Cess monsters, become unaffected by your opponent's card effects until the end of the turn. And finally, if you control a Link 3 or higher Marine Cess monster, you can activate the Marine Cess Wave from your hand. Now, targeted effect negation like this is a really valuable form of disruption that has been emulated by cards like Effect Veiler, Breakthrough Skill, and Forbidden Chalice. It's a relatively simple effect, but one that can be used to great effect and can occasionally be turn-ending when used on a key combo piece. And because Marine Cess Wave is capable of being activated from the hand, provided you control a Link 3 or higher Marine Cess monster, it can be used to mirror Effect Veiler almost exactly as a hand trap. In fact, it's actually better than Effect Veiler, as it can be used during either player's turn and during any phase, while Effect Veiler can only be used during your opponent's main phase. Wave even has a bonus effect that it makes every single one of your monsters unaffected by card effects, making them difficult to out other than by battle. In the past, Marine Cess Wave has had the issue that while it was a very strong form of interruption, it was a card that you either had to draw 
or hopefully mill it using the secondary effect of Marine Cess Blue Tang. This meant that Finding Wave was often somewhat unreliable. But with the newly revealed Marine Cess Coral Triangle, Marine Cess Wave now can be searched directly from the deck reliably, making it not just a valuable tool for disruption, but a consistent one as well. Now of course Marine Cess Wave does have its problems, you do need to control a Link monster in order to activate it. This isn't something difficult for Marine Cess to do, as they have a bevy of links and extenders in order to climb into Link 2, 3, and 4 monsters. But it means that going second, Wave can't really be used as a hand trap like Effect Veiler, and it needs a Link 3 in order to be used as a going second tool in the same vein as Forbidden Chalice. But for what it is, Wave is a very powerful archetype tool that's only been made stronger by recent support, and has activation requirements that are super easy to fulfill, putting it cleanly at the number 7 spot. And at number 6, we have Zephra War. One of the two trap cards belonging to the Zephra archetype, you can only activate it once per turn, and can activate it from your hand provided you have two Zephra Pendulum monsters in your Pendulum Scales. And it has the relatively simple effect that you can target another Zephra card you control and one card your opponent controls to destroy them. Now, Zephra's War's effect is somewhat strong, being a destruction of any card your opponent controls makes it quite versatile, as it's able to deal with monsters, spell, and trap-based threats provided you have another Zephyr card to destroy. But what really brings Zephyr War over the top is its ability to be searched during your opponent's turn in a similar fashion to Phantasm Spiral Battle. You see, one of the main playmakers of Zephra is Zephyr Nui's Secret of the Yang Zing, which allows you to search any Zephra or Yang Zing spell or trap card upon a successful Pendulum Summon or Destruction. So in order to use the search effect as often as possible, Zephyr decks usually use the effect of Zephrath to put Zephyr Nui directly from the deck into the extra deck in order to Pendulum Summon Zephyr Nui back in order to trigger its search effect. And Zephyr Nui has a lot of powerful search targets. Zephyr Path is an interesting floodgate, Zephyr Divine Strike is an amazing interruption, Zephyr Providence can search for any other Zephyr card, and of course Zephyr War can also be searched. But you may be surprised to know that more often than not, you're not searching for a Zephyr card at all. You're actually searching for Nine Pillars of the Yang Zing. Nine Pillars of the Yang Zing is a counter trap that allows you to negate any spell or trap card or monster effect and then shuffle the negated card back into the deck, then you must destroy a Yang Zing card you control. The reason why Nine Pillars is so strong is not only due to its incredible effect negation, but also because it forms a Diablical tag team with Zephyr War. You see, in order to use the effect of Nine Pillars, you need to control and then destroy a Yang Zing card. And it just so happens that Zephyr Nui, Secret of the Yang Zing, is a Yang Zing card that also allows you to gain advantage upon its destruction. This is where Zephyr War comes in. Usually this extra search during your opponent's turn would simply be a card that you'd wait until your next turn to use. But if you choose to search Zephyr War, you can use it as an extra form of interruption immediately since you can activate it from your hand. Now, this card is somewhat costly, as you do need to destroy a Zephyr card you control, and you can't gain advantage off of Zephyr Nui twice in the same turn. But you can also pair Zephyr War alongside the graveyard effect of Zephyr Providence to protect your Zephyr cards from being destroyed by a card effect, including the effect of Zephyr War, mitigating the loss in card advantage War otherwise would have caused. All in all, Zephyr War is an incredible form of interruption that pairs well with cards within and even outside its archetype, and doesn't require too much setup besides what the deck already wants to do. And even its particular downside can be countered by its own archetype. And at number 5, we have Typhoon. A normal trap that's often forgotten about in the hierarchy of spell and trap removal, but is nonetheless quite strong. Typhoon states quite plainly that it can be used to target one face-up spell or trap card in the field and destroy it. But, provided you control no spell and trap cards, and your opponent controls two or more spell and trap cards, you can activate it directly from your hand. Being able to only target face-up spell and trap cards means that Typhoon loses a lot of versatility when compared to cards like Mystical Space Typhoon or Cosmic Cyclone, since they can also target set spell and trap cards as well. However, Typhoon fills a specific niche that these cards can't, because Typhoon is a hand trap that can be used during your opponent's turn, during the very first turn of the duel, and can be used as a premium form of disruption to prevent your opponent from building up their board. This is particularly useful against pendulum-based strategies, as while a pendulum monster card is in the pendulum zone, it counts as a spell card. So during your opponent's first turn, the moment they try to set up their two scales for a pendulum summon, or try to use a particularly strong effect, like Oaf Dragon Magician or Odd Eyes Arc Pendulum Dragon, you can simply activate Typhoon to destroy their scale. And because most Pendulum cards need to remain face up on the field in order to resolve their effects, destroying them also means that your opponent won't get access to their strong effects. But Typhoon's strengths don't stop there, as it can be used against any particular strategy that relies on their spell and trap cards to build their board. True Draco, for example, is a control deck that relies on its continuous spells and trap cards in order to tribute some in their boss monsters. 
But, like pendulum cards, if these face-up continuous cards are destroyed before their effects can resolve, then they simply resolve without any effect. Currently, Typhoon doesn't see too much competitive play, mainly due to the larger versatility of the previously mentioned Cosmic Cyclone and Mystical Space Typhoons, but it does occasionally appear as a tech choice for decks worried about particular floodgates. During the time when Imperial Order was legal, for example, a card that negates all spell effects on the field, Sky Striker decks would often employ Typhoon alongside Royal Decree in order to have ways to deal with their opponent's Imperial Order with a card that wasn't a spell card so it wouldn't be negated. And even now with Imperial Order banned, Typhoon is still an effective way to deal with popular floodgates like Anti-Spell Fragrance or Gozen Match, while also still having utility against some combo decks that rely on continuous or field spells, giving it a specific niche to fill that other similar cards in Mystical Space Typhoon or Harpy's Feather Dusters can't. And speaking of Harpy's Feather Duster, flying in at number 4 is Harpy's Feather Storm. Feather Storm is a normal trap and can only be activated if you control a Wind Winged Beast type monster, but if you happen to control a Harpy monster, you can also activate Harpy Storm directly from your hand. And it has the effect that until the end of this turn, every single monster effect that your opponent activates in the hand, field, graveyard, banish zone, or anywhere else is negated. And if that wasn't enough, it also has the extra effect that if it's destroyed in the spell and trap card zone by an opponent's card effect, you can search a Harpy's Feather Duster directly from your deck. Harpy's Feather Storm is an absurd card that Harpies can use to its full effect. Being a trap card that's activatable from your hand at any point, as long as you control any Harpy monster, allows it to be used when your opponent's going first to essentially skip your opponent's turn since they can't use monster effects, or even when going second, as it essentially acts as an archetype Dark Ruler no more. In fact, it's even better than Dark Ruler no more, as not only can it be used in response to an opponent's effect, but it also negates any monster effects from anywhere for the entire turn, meaning that it also negates your opponent's monster base hand traps. In fact, Harpy's Feather Storm is such a powerful card that other decks that aren't Harpies have also incorporated into their strategies. During the time Tribrigade decks were meta relevant, they would often use Harpy's Featherstorm as a way to skip their opponent's turn when going first, since the deck was extremely capable of accessing Wind, Winged Beast monsters, either through the use of Tribrigade effects to summon out Wind, Winged Beast monsters, or by using Lyralist monsters to go into rank 1 Wind, Winged Beast like in Blue Robin. In fact, Tribrigade even played a Harpy's monster in their extra deck, Harpy Conductor, and while the deck usually struggled to properly link summon Harpy's Conductor, they could simply use the effect of any main deck Tribrigade monster to summon it out, and as a result, Tribrigade could also technically have an activated Harpy's Featherstorm from their hand. Although, this wasn't too likely to happen, as Harpy's Conductor was usually just an easy way to bring out a Winged Beast type monster to link summon some more Bird of Sovereignty, which was able to summon out either a Barry Statue of the Stormwinds or Apex Avian. Currently, Featherstorm is still seeing competitive play in Flunderese decks as a side option when they know that they're going first, as many of the Flunderese monsters, including their boss monster, Flunderese and Empin, are wind, winged beast type monsters, and a resolved Featherstorm can just win the game on its own. And even if it does somehow get destroyed without being able to be chained by something like a Night Beam or a Delta Crow Anti-Reverse, you get to search Harpy's Feather Duster for any spell and trap cards that your opponent controls. But it only makes it the number 4 spot on this list, despite its astonishing power. Namely due to the fact that decks that can use it are quite niche, and not as generic as cards higher on this list. And more often than not, its ability to be used from the hand isn't really being used. Instead, it's more so just used as a proactive floodgate. But in terms of proactive floodgates, there are very few which are as powerful as Harpy's Featherstorm, which is why it's so high on this list. Especially since it can be used to search a card to clear your opponent's back row. And speaking of back row wiping cards... And at number 3, we have Evenly Matched, a normal trap card that can only be activated from the hand when you control no cards at all. And it has the effect where if your opponent controls more cards than you do, at the end of the battle phase you can make your opponent banish cards from their field face down so they control the same number of cards as you. So if you only control the face up Evenly Matched, your opponent is only allowed to keep one card on their side of the field. Now, despite the heavy number of requirements necessary to even use Evenly Matched, it actually sees a large amount of competitive play, specifically because it's able to be used from the hand as a tool to clear out most of your opponent's board. So if you're going second and your opponent sets up a board of strong monsters, a board of powerful back row, or both at the same time, Evenly Match can be used to clear out most of the board by itself, provided it doesn't get negated. In comparison, a card used in a similar fashion, Lightning Storm, can only be used to clear either back row or monsters, and can't be used both at the same time. So, while Lightning Storm is versatile in what it can destroy, it has less overall generic utility compared to a card like Evenly Match. Even the specific way in which Evenly Match clears the field is astonishingly strong. In Yu-Gi-Oh, Banishing is one of the strongest ways to deal with a card. 
as it prevents the graveyard effects from being activated and it's generally difficult to interact with the banished cards, though not impossible. Banishing cards face down, however, makes it even more difficult to interact with them, while also preventing effects that would trigger when banished from having the chance to activate, such as Elemental Hero Absolute Zero. It's even capable of dealing with monsters that are unaffected by cards effects, as evenly matched doesn't affect cards, it forces the opponent to perform an action. And thus, if your opponent controls an unaffected monster, like Super Quantal Mech King Great Magnus, it can still be banished by evenly matched if your opponent chooses to do so. In fact, if your opponent controls something like an adventurer token, they're actually forced to banish everything except for the token. As per game mechanics, tokens can never be banished face down. So with all of this going for it, why does Evenly Match only make it to the number 3 spot? For as versatile as the card is, it does have its key weaknesses. For example, Lightning Storm can be used to clear an opponent's entire field and deal with every one of their disruptions on board or just spell or traps, or a board of just monsters. Meanwhile, Evenly Match is always guaranteed to leave your opponent with one card. And if that one card just so happens to be a problematic Floodgate or some supremely strong boss monster, it can still be quite difficult to deal with and potentially game winning, especially because Evenly Match forces you to give up your battle phase. And although the battle phase is less important than the main phase, it's still an extremely necessary part of the game, as giving it up means that you can't damage your opponent to OTK them, or use the battle phase as a resource to attack over any of their boss monsters. So for as strong as Evenly Matched is, it's somewhat balanced, though the cost is still very much worth it as it cuts off a lot of your opponent's resources and boss monsters out of the game completely provided it resolves, making Evenly Matched a card that should always be considered in a side deck or even main decks of decks that want to go second, as it's usable by just about any deck that's willing to give up a single battle phase, making Evenly Match a generic, strong card that can be game determinative on its own, which is why it makes number 3 spot on this list. And at number 2, we have Red Reboot. Red Reboot is a counter trap card with the effect that when your opponent activates a trap card, you can negate the trap card and if you do, set it back face down into the field. Then your opponent can set any trap card they want from their deck. And for the rest of this turn, after Red Reboot resolves, your opponent cannot activate any trap cards at all. And in order to activate it from the hand, you need to pay half your life points. At first glance, it appears that Red Reboot has a lot of downsides, which makes it an unattractive card to counter back row strategies. It only deals with trap cards, it sets the opponent's card face down so they can just use it again on the next turn, and furthermore, your opponent gets to set their best trap card from their deck for free. Especially since to use it from your hand, you need to pay a huge sum of life points. But even with all of these restrictions and costs, Red Reboot is still strong enough to be limited on the Forbidden Limited list to this day. And that's mainly because of the huge floodgate Red Reboot puts on back row decks. A lot of back row decks mainly rely on trap cards as their main form of interruption and Red Reboot completely shuts down trap cards for an entire turn, preventing back row decks from having a chance to interrupt their opponent, unless they happen to have drawn a counter trap to negate Red Reboot, like Solemn Judgment or Seven Tools of the Bandit. As normal and continuous trap cards, or even monster effects like Baron de Fleur, can't be used to respond to counter trap cards like Red Reboot, only other counter trap cards can. And so once Red Reboot resolves, not only does it negate an opponent's trap, you can play your turn without worrying about trap cards entirely, allowing you to OTK your opponent before they have a chance to activate their trap cards next turn. Or alternatively, if you can't OTK, you could simply wipe the field with a card like Divine Arsenal AA Zoo Sky Thunder, putting a trap-based deck like Subterror at a major disadvantage. There are, of course, some countermeasures that can be taken against Red Reboot. After you use the card, you do still have to worry about your opponent's spell cards and monster effects, and if you don't manage to OTK your opponent or clear the field, not only have you given your opponent any trap card they want, you've also lost a half your life points to use it from your hand, making you more likely to get OTK'd yourself. But with how many accessible tools there are to OTK your opponent or clear the field, more likely than not Red Reboot is going to be an incredible asset rather than a detriment, and one that's absolutely silver bullet for any trap based deck in the game, and is extremely usable by any deck in the game making it more than deserving the number 2 spawn this list. But there is one more trap card that's activatable from the hand that's even more generic and versatile than Red Reboot. And at number 1 is Infinite Impermanence. This is a normal trap card with the extremely simple effect that you can target one face-up monster your opponent controls and negate its effects until the end of the turn. And if it was set before it was activated, every spell and trap effect that's used in the column Infinite Impermanence was set in will be negated. But if you control no cards, instead of setting infinite impermanence, you can instead activate it directly from your hand. This targeted effect negation is an extremely powerful effect, especially on a hand trap like infinite impermanence, 
as not only can it be used to break your opponent's board by negating one of their end board bosses, it can also be used to negate one of their key combo pieces to prevent them from extending into strong boss monsters. The difference between a card like Marinsus Wave and Infinite Impermanence, however, is that you can use Infinite Impermanence during your opponent's first turn, as in order to activate it from your hand, you only need to control no cards, while something like Marinsus Wave, despite being able to be used in a similar fashion, requires some level of setup. Meanwhile, Infinite Impermanence is very easy to utilize, especially for such a premium effect, and has allowed Infinite Impermanence to see widespread competitive play as one of the best hand traps currently in the game. Even before Infinite Impermanence was released, a very similar card, Effect Veiler, was an absolute staple hand trap that is still seen play to this very day because targeted effect negation of a hand trap is so versatile and strong. And even if you don't activate Infinite Impermanence from your hand, and instead choose to set it on the field, you also get a fairly relevant bonus effect of negating all spell and trap card effects within the same column for the rest of the turn, and can catch a lot of players off guard if they don't remember the Infinite Impermanence column after it's been activated. In fact, Infinite Impermanence has even changed the way people play Yu-Gi-Oh! As now, it's very common to make sure your activated spell and trap cards are in different columns to set spell and trap cards that your opponent controls, in order to avoid accidentally activating an important spell in the same column where an infinite impermanence could be. And even when it's not set in the field, infinite impermanence is still a versatile form of interruption that any deck can play as a hand trap when going second, or can even just add to an end board when it's set. It does have some minor issues, of course. Controlling any card prevents it from being used from the hand, so it can't really be used as a hand trap if you draw into a decode talker heat soul, or while you have a board set up. But since you can set infinite impermanence and still use this effect as a bonus effect, the disadvantage is fairly minor. Overall, infinite impermanence is a strong hand trap that's helped change the way people play the game, which is why it earns the title of the best trap card you can activate from your hand. All right, and that's the list. If you know of any other trap cards we may have missed or have ideas for future videos just like this one, please let us know down in the comments below.